Welcome to the world of grimy budget guitars, ladies and gentlemen. The Ibanez Geo. Clearly a much loved and much played guitar, but suffering from a health and safety disaster. And um, clearly in need of some TLC, not least that going on there. Uh, and it's, well, even this video can't quite describe how grubby things are. Um, <laughs> oh, there's a crack there in the finish. It's probably, who knows, it's probably a seam. Maybe a seam. No, it's actually, it wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a wood seam, would it? A timber seam. Anyway, crack in the finish. But, so, so look, we've got an old, an old beater with a horribly high action, um, grimy, screws hanging off um, and if we sort of look over here well, I'm just going to try and hold it up but we've also got a splitting fingerboard which you probably can't see very well but it you can feel it it's coming away right there for about three inches down by the nut so and you know not probably not a very nice nut there so the good news is I've got a, a tusk replacement black tusk nut here which is the right string spacing Got some new strings, got some sacrificial strings if we need them. Um, and we're going to give this a full reloved setup and bring it back to life. Now, what we also know about it straight away um, is that the jack socket is disconnected and it's not putting out anything at all. So, we're going to fix this thing up and hopefully um, I'll talk through it as I do it. And if you're, if you're an experienced guitar setter up, and none of it will be new, but this, let's imagine I'm saying this for um, the owner who came over, brought it over yesterday. Um, and, you know, he can be listening out for things to look out for in future to keep his guitars playing happily longer. And it may explain some of the things that, um, you know, he, he may have been curious about why it was behaving the way it was. So that's the purpose of the video, to do a complete setup. And it's straight away, it's a budget guitar. We all know the Ibanez Geo. It's, there's nothing overly flash about it. Right? It's a good quality budget guitar that has an Ibanez neck, which is never a bad thing. Question with this one um, is, well, some people say, uh, is it worth spending um, you know, my price for a setup on a guitar like this? when, hey, for, for just about the same money, you could go and buy another one. Well, you could, but you would get most of the same, well, not most, you'd get a fair percentage of the same problems, and the basic playability problem would be, would come with the new one, because even from new, there is no, uh, there is no kind of great setup um, guaranteed. But we've got a basic thing here which will benefit from the setup that we're going to do. Now, uh, what I'm trying to think of at this point in time is the way round I'm going to do things. So um, it's a, probably a little bit different from my normal setup because I think normally I would be sort of diving into something straight away. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, these strings, by the way, will probably break straight away. So I'm going to be prepared. I probably should just sacrifice a set of Mm, sacrificial strings anyway but what I was going to do is let's begin by locking the tremolo down for the time being and it might have to stay down if we don't ultimately find um, what, what, why will it stay down oh yes if we don't find an arm for it because it's not going to be much use so, so this is a good start point um, and what you want to do if you're setting up a guitar is even if you're setting the tremolo moving, floating, or whatever, is to begin with, you want to load the springs. Uh, let's have a look. And you want to dial them in so that it brings the tremolo plate flat down on the ground, on the deck, I should say. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another spring to this recipe. That's if it's long enough. I should be able to. And maybe too too big of a stretch, if you'll excuse the American timing. Uh, is this too big of a stretch? It is a hell of a stretch. Mm hmm. 
don't think I've got any thing of any greater length. Let's, let's have a little dig in my uh, in my box of spares and see if there are any that are inherently longer than any others. That's a bit longer, isn't it? No. Yes, fractionally. Hmm. Let's see if we can make it with one of these springs. Oh. Get on there. Stay on there. Bit of muscle to get it plugged in. Come on. In you go. Uh, mm. There we are. Three springs in the back. And we're still not pulling down. So we've got too much tension on there. So I'm going to slack a bit more tension off the... Uh, headstock by undoing the springs a bit. We need to be able to dial this flat and three springs should do it no matter what strings are on there. So if it's, uh, all right, now it's down. Having taken the pressure off, I'll show you a close up now. So now the thing is down on the deck for the time being. Right, so that's a good start. We've flattened it down. This means now we can look at the what's possible in terms of the action. The, the only um, way of setting the action on this bridge here is by these two posts either end. So it has a, it looks like it has a built-in radius on it, um, hmm, which is pretty flat anyway. So we've got to use a hex key, looks for the size of the thing. We've got to use a hex key to um, adjust this bridge anymore. So I'm, all I'm doing at this moment in time is just seeing how where this bridge will sit. My God, oh, that's, uh, that, is, that is well and truly stuck in place. Ooh. <laughs> uh, mm, mm. So here's me recommending doing this, and what I'm thinking of is, I think I'm going to I'm going to go a different course now. I'm going to cut the strings off. And we'll go with some. We'll take see if we can address this bridge because if this uh, this is seized in place, then we're not going to get very far with this bridge. So I'm going to slack the strings off, and we'll get the clippers on them and cut them off. Um, just the way it has to be. Ooh, goodbye, 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 goodbye. Yuck. <laughs> so off this end here, I'm going to. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put some gloves on. Nothing personal, but it is a bit manky at this point in time. So I'll need to wash my hands a couple of times along the way, but I think we prob probably ought to start with a bit of hand covering. So plan A, foiled by the bridge not cooperating. Um, because it's an unknown quantity. And truth is, a guitar of this age and condition is, from the outset, an unknown quantity, because we don't know whether there's something, a showstopper problem. Um, so that's the kind of first bit, really, is to, oh, Lordy, a tangled up string on here, which really doesn't help get the whole thing undone. Uh, yeah, we, so we, we're sort of assessing as we go what the re what the realistic likelihood of being able to set this up right. Now, from yesterday, when Oliver brought this over, um, it looked straight off as a viable thing, but I hadn't really had a chance to look at the bridge. So there are some things you can't know. So those evil strings, part of them, have gone in there. And then these, sorry you can't see for a minute, but I'm just going to push these out of the... Oh, God. They're corroded in place as well, some of them. I think we'll get all but one out, and then we'll push the next one through with a hex key. Down you go. Out you go. There we are. Ooh. Right, I'll come back to the bridge end of things so you can see. So I love jobs like this, I have to say, because they are minging 
in the nicest possible way. Filthy. Right, so we've done that. I think we'll take off the springs again and we'll re re reduce the pull on the bridge. So let's slack this off a bit more. So the uh, these tremolo claw screws are really useful for changing the load on the tremolo. And the tremolo system is basically always a balance between the pull of the strings and the pull of the springs. So the pull of the strings on top going that way and the pull of the springs on the bottom going that way as well around a pivot point. So what was I going to do? Oh yeah, I was going to take these off. Um, so it's always a balance and when you get the thing in balance um, that's where your bridge will stay. So off comes this bridge which is a twin point bridge and it's absolutely filthy so I could probably just brush some of the fluff out of it for a minute but I want to take it all apart and clean it anyway but it's a decent quality bridge even though it's not a it's not where are we it's not a massively weighty one it is quite a lot chunkier than most sort of squire bridges now this is what's concerning me straight away so I think what I'll first do is I'll get a bit of uh, material on a cloth, a bit of material, a bit of naphtha cleaning fluid, and I'll just take off some of this grime here so I'm not working entirely through dust, although it still won't be very clean. So naphtha is a good all-purpose guitar cleaner stroke solvent, very safe for all guitar finishes. Um, but this is going to take a bit more than that when, when all said and done. But it's all right for starting off the cleanup process, as you can see. Just so that I can handle the thing a bit more safely, confidently. But we'll take everything out at some point and clean it up. Phew. Right, that's just a first wipe down. So the concern here is these things and they are fixed into here and if they're fixed too far in they're doomed but without the loading on them they're at least coming out they do sound a bit scratchy but we can always lubricate that so that's some that one's out that's pretty good hopefully this one will do the same right what it also tells me is that they're screwed down pretty much as far as they would go which then tells me, they look a bit worn out, those things. What it tells me is that I don't think we'll get the saddle to sit any lower, sorry, the bridge to sit any lower um, on this. So the, if we're going to get a lower action than we just had, which is the whole point of this, as well as cleaning it up, then we're going to need to shim this neck to allow the uh, strings to come down on the bridge or it basically brings the neck up to meet to meet them and that's possible to do so we will we will do that shortly and I think while I'm at it now um, I think we ought to do that now so we'll go into that mode right now which is flip this over now there's another thing on this guitar that we have to do and that is to um, blew up this crack in the neck. Well, it's not crack, it's a split where the fingerboard comes away. But we can have a look at that. And what I was hoping not to do is end up leaving this overnight. It'd be nice if we could do the setup part and then glue it last. Um, let's see if I can make this come out. Came along. Thank you. So the great thing about stripping down a guitar is it may seem really complicated, but it isn't that complicated. There's not a lot to it. If we can actually get these bits out successfully. Come on. Um, yeah, there's no, it's not, it's quite simple. You have to keep in mind that it's a, 
it's a neck, it's a body, it's some pickups, and they all kind of go together pretty reliably well. And there's what your inside of your neck pocket looks like, which is a little bit grimy. So there's there's the wood is sort of puckered up on here from where it's been screwed in. So that's a bit rag, ragged, but we can we can always clean it down with a blade carefully. Um, it will never be perfect because as you put the screws in, it always tends to pucker up a little bit. But if we don't want it sort of sticking up in the way uneven, we can always clean it back a little bit like that. Get rid of that. And then in here, just do a similar thing. There's some bits of wood sort of sticking around. Now I'm wondering whether someone's... Uh, just have a look whether somebody's actually filled these with any wood or something in the past. But I think that's okay. When you're, there's a little shim on the side there, but we can leave that where it is. What we're going to be concerned about is putting a shim on here, shim on, to raise it up. Now, while I'm at it, I have a standard shim size that I would revert to on a guitar like this, and I think I'll just employ it right away um, because we're going to need that extra little bit of height um, in order to get the what I call the playing geometry right from the start. It's very common, this, by the way, that the guitar comes with the uh, action not lowerable to the desired height. And as I, I was talking to you, Oliver, yesterday about the, the limitations on your guitar playing action is, is usually the underlying the condition of the underlying fret, i.e. how uneven they are. Um, also, they're, they're, if the guitar is made with a geometry that... Oops, that was a string I could use. Um, if the geometry is not quite right, it can be playable with a tall action, but most people I know want a lower action than is commonly the case. So when it comes like that, it's really common that I have to shim the neck pocket uh, to lift the neck heel up a bit. Um, and some people hate the idea of doing that, um, some companies like Fender used to have a device built into their guitars called the Micro Tilt, which was a, a, a sort of screw, screw sort of thing that pushed the, uh, you could adjust and it pushed the neck heel upwards so you could make your own adjustments without doing this business that I'm doing now. So it was good enough for Fender at some point, but the purists often will come up with a slightly nervous and difficult to prove statements like they will say um, oh but if you have a thing underneath the neck it will distort the neck heel or it will it will strangle the tone so the tone won't flow to the pickups or some sort of thing and it never has it's never very clear to understand the, uh, the the means by which this is supposed to happen now I'm just looking at this here and seeing whether I've got enough room for this particular shim so it needs to be a little bit thinner so I'll just cut it a tiny bit more thinly but it's a, it's a 0.25 millimeter piece of brass which I know will lift the end of the neck by an all-important 0.25 mils which is usually just what I need to um, give me that extra push-up so a very small push-up <laughs> right, you lot get out of the way very small push up at that end will make a big difference in the geometry. Bits of wood stuck here. It's not very good. <laughs> yeah, it makes a big difference in the, the overall seating of the neck heel. Right, there it is in at that end. Now, we could do the whole of the rest of the work for now with the neck off, but I, th I think it makes sense for me to put it back on just now while I make sure that it's done a, a job that I want it to do. So I'm just going to lift it up out of range, probably. Let's see if you can see it from here. Sorry. One-handed camera work. There we are, something like that. So I'm going to redo this. And then I think we'll put on, shortly, we'll put on the sacrificial strings and see. So what I 
tend to do is that I tend to make sure that the geometry, the basic geometry is right. If it isn't right and it can't be made right, then it doesn't really doesn't make sense to spend a lot of time on the guitar. Um, so it's always worth checking out these basics. Um, can it be, can it, first of all, can it, is there anything stopping it getting into the basic playing action range that we want? And with this one, to begin with, there was. So we couldn't, with that neck heel sitting the way it was sitting, we couldn't reach the low action. The bridge wouldn't go low enough and the saddles won't go any lower. So I'm tightening that up. Okay, back together. This time now, you won't be able to see it with the naked eye, but this time the bridge is sitting, uh, sorry, the neck is sitting up higher. And it means that when we put the strings on, the strings will come close to meeting the uh, correct height. We'll have a better height and it will be workable. Now, I think one of the things that would be good to do now is to, let's take off, let's take off, let's take off the truss rod cover. The truss rod cover is where we will make sure and adjust the curvature of the neck. Lots of people tell lots of scary and untrue things about truss rod adjustment. Um, if you're like me, you've probably spent a lot of your life being scared of making truss rod adjustments because whether it's in the forums or in articles, it seems that the experts sort of like to give the impression that you know the if you if you get involved in adjusting the truss rod in there you'll do some sort of terrible damage well i've got to tell you that ain't true now what i want to do is i want to find me some water bear with me a second oh there's some water there's some water and I want some washing up liquid, can you believe? And I'm going to do the first attack on this guitar neck with just some washing up liquid and some water. And I don't want to drench it, so I'm going to have kitchen roll standing by. But I also don't want to waste expensive solvents just to clear off this, um, this generic crud. But it's a good, a good start. So we'll get ready to clean up. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Very satisfying. All the years of teenage crud being removed. Hopefully. Um, by the way, guitars and. Um, Water are okay as long as you dry everything um, before you move on. So, you know, for example, the tuners will take them off and clean the headstock up properly. So this, we can afford to get them wet at this point in time. This is a bit, this bristly thing is a bit knackered, but it'll sort of do. Mm -hmm. If you have baked on grime that will not come off. One of the things you can do is you can clean it quite quickly with um, a blade and you might prefer to do it this way and it's quite thorough. So if we weren't going to wipe it with water, if you get the blade in there and you sort of scrape up to the fret, you will scrape away the crud right up to the fret and you get this sort of disgusting finger goo um, but it is a sort of it's a kind of um, a nice thorough way uh, but you depends on what you what you prefer to do you can do it with the um, <coughs> you can do it with the scrubbing brush approach I think I might since it's quite baked in I think I might just go all the way on this thing with the blade and get rid of all this hard crud and we could even 
look at vacuuming it up so it doesn't go everywhere in the workshop. This one, this blade is a bit tired and emotional, so I'm going to bin that one. So the thing you will see that on a guitar that's in good shape, a setup, my setup, might take, in really good shape, my setup will take about two hours. An average condition guitar with a few little things needing sort of taken care of along the way, it'll take three hours. And a guitar like this will probably, with the neck fingerboard split, it'll probably take longer. Um, but I don't mind um, the ones that take a bit longer because it is swings and roundabouts. Some of them are quicker than others. And um, so I kind of win on some and lose on time on others. But they, they all get the same treatment, whether it's uh, somebody's Gibson 335 the other day, or whether it's a £4,000 um, custom shop strap that I did the other last week or the week before last as well. So everything gets treated the same and some people kind of think that's weird and some people have grown up believing that every guitar has its own unique specification that that you know a luthier has to know um it's true that every manufacturer will s state their own recommendation for the settings um but a that's their kind of factory start point that they say they think is good for it but it uh, it, it really doesn't it doesn't dictate what you should have so I like to my customers generally want a very low and light easy to play action um, with no buzzes and no chokes and so to get that I always use some fret leveling to get rid of the limitations of uneven frets and um, my target is pretty much the same on most guitars for the action. The only time it changes is where the guitar has a particularly rounded neck radius, like an old vintage Strat with a 7.25 radius, which is much rounder than a modern guitar like this Ibanez, which has more like a 17 or 16 inch radius. So the tighter the radius, as it goes down in numbers, smaller the number of inches in the overall radius. The, um, the slightly higher you have to end up with the action if you want it choke free, buzz free. Uh, there's, a, there's a geometric constraint or limitation on those tight radii which you can't overcome by leveling. Um, you'd be mad too because you just keep on leveling for no tangible benefit and it would just cost you fret metal. So um, but that's the only that's the only major constraint. So I'm going to put your hands on your ears. I'm just going to vacuum away this grunge. Mm. And while I'm at it. So that's a, a start. Now what I might do now is give the fingerboard a run over with naphtha, just so it's sort of a little bit disinfected off kind of thing. Um, but that's fine. It's sort of it's refreshed it a bit. Whoops, there goes the nut. That's straight off. That's okay. We'll, we'll put the new one on, I suppose, fairly. Actually, no, for the leveling, we'll, we'll stick Stick with the old one to begin with. I'm trying to think what's the best approach. You see that's still pretty grimy. But there we are, that's what years of happy playing will get you. Now this will probably, the new one will probably, actually that sits on pretty much straight. This one is what they, I think they tend to call it a graphite nut. And it's just a plastic. It really doesn't perform any better than regular plastic. People, because it's got that cute name, people think it does. Um, 
and the tusk replacement looks almost the same, but it ain't. Now the thing is, um, what I said was, I'm concerned about the overall geometry first. That's my most important consideration. Um, at the moment, I am going to eventually run out of battery on this camera, so I may have to charge it, but it means I can't have the headphone mic. Mm -hmm. Rehydration. Uh, right, I need some... Uh, where is it gone? Where's my... Here's my... No, this is a... This is a jar full of... Um, in fact, I will use another one. I've got a couple of jars of thinners here that I use for cleaning my paint spraying stuff. And I'm going to... I'm going to sort of give these a little bit of a, a scrape if I can with a wire brush and then drop them in the thinners for a minute. Thinners um, is very unkind to nitrocellulose so you wouldn't want to be kind of using this around vintage nitro finishes. Um, it definitely dissolves nitro finish now but it doesn't actually have any major impact or negative impact on polyurethane so the thing to do is while this is absolutely filthy i'm also going to uh, take the saddles out of here and give them a clean up in the same goo i don't know why i'm using that end bit there so these are all, well, are they all the same or they have a, they appear to be flat, but they can't be unless this is bent. There's no vertical adjustment on here. So my concern is, unless they're numbered, uh, they may well be numbered. If they're numbered, that's fine. I can chuck them all in, fish them out once they're a bit cleaner and put them back. So let's just check that this says number two. Yes, thankfully. So there is a radius built in. That means a, a built-in curve that they've built into the actual saddles themselves. Good old Ibanez. They're, they're number three. That's what you'd expect from them. So I can take all of this stuff off and then we can dump the plate in there as well. Give that a clean up. Um, and then we can put the bridge back together again. Put bridge posts in and put some sacrificial strings and see whether we've got the basic geometry working in which case we can move onwards okay so there's all my bits that need cleaning in you go it'll take a while fishing these things out because they're going to float around in this soup for a bit now we can take the top plate off off the um, block with these three screws. But I can also test while these uh, this is off. We can clean it, obviously, but I can also test whether the spare tremolo arm that I've got fits or not. Now, in this case, I'm just going to brush this fluff off here, and we can throw that in there for a bit of cleaning. They don't need cleaning, and this doesn't really need cleaning. Just dust down to get rid of the fuzz but we've got our spare arm we've got our ah okay oh that's nice it's a push-in arm and i've got one of those at home for a damped so in the meantime i do have one at home i do have one at home but in the meantime i could use this one i'm pretty sure uh if i can find my where's it gone this one this one this, yeah this has a, has a little adjuster screw in the back, like the Wilkinson ones, and the idea is that this locks this arm in place, like so. Yeah, that will do for now. Good. I'll just pull that out. We'll, we'll use that for the time being, but I have got a Wil Wilkinson-style one. Okay, so that's positive. Let's get my stirring device. Got all our bits floating around in here. If I can now dig them out somehow. Oh, fantastic. The bridge plate fits exactly in there and won't come out. Oh, 
whose idea was this? <laughs> Mine. Thank you. So, unless it's essential to do so, I'll just bring these out and they can go. Ooh, this slime and grime, grime, grime and slime. There's quite a lot of built up goo on there. Well, we can do a bit with a metal polish in a minute on that one. Um, pull these things out one by one. This this would probably make an awful lot of sense to um, stop the filming for this part because you could tell already this bit could take quite some time. Um, I'll just lay everything out on here. Um, obviously, what we want, which isn't easy to get, is we do want it to sort of clean up somewhat. The aim is to make it look a bit cleaner. Um, there is some tarnishing on each of these pieces which will probably be helped by a little meeting with the Autosol uh, Chrome Cleaner. It's actually hard to see this and grab bits. Um, probably be better with a cloth rather than a paper towel. I mean, even even without taking the, uh, the patina off, then it's still cleaner and fresher than it was before. Um, now, that, as for the pickups themselves, we're going to take them out. We're going to brush them gently and get the obvious grime. And for the pole pieces on top, we don't really need to worry about them, although they look a bit rusty. Um, it's not... It doesn't impact on the way they work. So we wouldn't, for example, want to grind them down with any mm, polishing wheels or anything like that. Certainly not at the risk of taking any of the plastic of the bobbins or the pickup covers away because it doesn't make any sense. So um, you might be able to get spruce them up a bit with some autosol uh, pasty stuff, you know, the car chrome cleaner stuff. But beyond that, um, we won't try too hard to get the rust off. So we've got five of those saddles up now. And here comes the last one. <laughs> this is my general purpose mucky thinners, which everything, the parts of the paint gun get dropped in there first. Um, and then they go into the cleaner stuff for a final bath which I may not use at this point. I don't think I need to. So it's definitely got cleaner to begin with. But of course, the, the low, the worn out, worn out, the long winded bit is getting these fidgety bits out. Like, well, that's two things. Now, I'll probably end up sticking a magnet in there to get out all the springs and the screws. So there's one of the posts. Um, it, it doesn't look bad, actually. Um, we can get some grease in when we fit it back in into this. This is a bit corroded in the socket, but it won't. It's nothing so bad that it won't work. But it could do with some grease in there. There's the other one. Frets are looking pretty good. There's a little bit of wear down that end, but the the fret leveling process will take care of that. Okay, so now what I really want is to trust the magnet, <laughs> and I have this slightly the moment slightly grimy magnet because I use it for picking stuff up off the floor but let's uh, let's invite it to do some extra special work in here why thank you <coughs> not quite all of it yet but ooh that grisly grime okay there's a bit of broken off grub screw in there which we don't really care about. We've got these screws. They look a bit crappy, but they're not they're not corroded so much. They're just a little bit grungy. Got another one there. So that's our six of these screws. It does look it does look tired. It's, it's probably got loads of magnetic bits sticking to it. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six screws. So we we have everything from our collection of or our bath of stuff. 
cellulose. Very well. And my magnet for rescuing missing things on the floor gets out of the way. So this cloth now becomes a mucky cloth for here. Okay, so what I think I'll do is, without too much um, hesitation, let's get a bit of, oh, I've split my gloves. Let's get a bit of uh, grease onto the uh, thingies here and turn them and push them in, fit them in. So the grease will just ease them going down into the what's it holes, things. Um, now, obviously, there is a low limit, a lower limit to how far this can go in. Um, we kind of get down there and then in an ideal world, we'll get down there and we'll actually need to come up a little bit if, if everything's kind of working well. So that actually, the, this one doesn't go down as far as the other one for some reason. Well, it sort of does, but it's not massively happy. So, of course, we do want them on a level, um, which means we're going to have to do our best to make sure that the neck is correctly shimmed so we can have this bridge placed comfortably. A bit of grease on there, but we'll have to um, thingy it that off with some of this in a minute. Okay, let's take off these gloves for a minute because we've got a fair chunk of the goo out of the way and I can could do with my having access to my fingers. Now this is this is could do with a little bit of a clean up so I'll find my ancient thing of autosol and we'll use this grimy cloth here and the autosol is fantastic a bit mucky to begin with but it, a little tiny amount of this really does go on chrome and shine it up very quickly so we can get rid of that initial well that long st stuck baked on tarnish very very effectively um, using autosol. We can do the same for the saddles if they're too grimy. But you'll see very quickly that tarnish is pretty much gone and we've got a nice clean plate. Um, look at these quickly, see if they're worth saving. Again, the tiniest amounts. So all we're really looking at is, a, is around the flat chromed sides all the way around um, should be quick enough when I'm doing this stuff off camera it's quite nice because I've got a film or something in the background on the on my Hawaii phone and I can sort of zone out to it but when doing it on on camera I've got to be continuing rabbiting that's a bit of goo gone into the screw hole which is not so brilliant but not the end of the world I was uh, listening to a few different commentaries, podcasts and whatnot, talking about the, uh, the, the missing submersible vessel, the Titan, which has gone ad adrift or disappeared down originally on its way to the Titanic. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrible tale, I have to say. I mean, I've been a, a Titanic obsessive for longer than I care to remember. And I've read almost everything there is out there. <laughs> I don't know why. And some the people who are like me and, and have an interest in the Titanic, they'll know exactly what I'm on about. Um, it's a, it's something that you can get quite obsessed about because of. Um, I think somebody once called it back in my days in, in the early days of multimedia in college when I was teaching. It used to there was a thing they used to call the the violence hub um, and it meant that a, it, or it referred to a it was some trendy arts art design uh, term describing a, a a multimedia architecture of an event that yeah and when, when we mean multimedia we're talking about 1993 definition so in those days god almighty in those days um we were we were experiencing or seeing the first kind of um, 
popular non-geek type of um, programming or coding, which was in a sort of a arts and design environment, we used um, HyperCard, this, this sort of stack of images and texts organized and run by not on the Apple, um, early Apple hardware. And, and HyperCard and SuperCard that came after, I think, were the first sort of, for the user, they were the first time you could put a load of information and content on a screen and then create buttons and options and opportunities for a user to kind of experience your information in a non-linear way. And it was, it was, I mean, you can't describe how new it was. Hypertext was all the rage. That's what the, the you know, the, the university lecturer of the day kind of talked about the whole time because <laughs> it was so like new and surprising um, but of course you know now now it wouldn't raise an eyebrow but then it was the first time that an artist for example could make an interactive experience um, that uh, a user could come along and experience something slightly different from the next person who experienced something slightly different from the next person and so on and so on. One, two, three. What number is this then? Two lots of three. Oh, that's handy. Oh, God. One. Okay, maybe it's like this. We go one, two, three, two, one, two, three, three, two, one. That's got to be what it is. Same on either side. Um, anyway, yes. Yeah, so, th so there was this. Uh, there was this thing called HyperCard that was just all the rage, and so all the art students, kind of me. And, oh no, I can't do that yet. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, all the projects that were being done from that point onwards were being done in HyperCard and creating sort of different experiences, and and it was the first interactive art there was kind of going on, which was amazing. Um, and one of the things they talked about, or we talked about, was uh, the concept of uh, this violence hub, which was usually a violent or shocking event, like a murder in films or seri you know, detective series, but the, the, or a crash or a significant tr trauma in a in a disaster film. And the multimedia was seen seen as a really use a really good way of being able to show all the different paths of the characters that came to that event um, so you could really go into it in detail to show their their particular pathway to it in a way that you you know a film in the old days would only ever just sort of set it in stone you would see that character arrive but in multimedia you could you could you could show this character's um, kind of life and interests before and after the event, if you see what I mean. So it was all big and thrilling stuff, and that's why, that's why I was um, thinking about it. And I have no idea now what I was talking about. I was talking about the, the Titanic, wasn't I? That's right. And I was saying that for some sorts of people, and that's me, and I think my brother's the same actually. For some reason, the Titanic is this amazing quote-unquote violence hub you know it's a, a dreadful momentous event that happens that you can keep looking at from different angles um, and seeing different experiences um, you know because in the Titanic there's there's 2,300 or whatever it is passengers many of whom were known and of which there was documentation so there's all of those people to learn about and and including 800 or so who survived about wh which about whom quite a lot more is known so it's a it's a sort of a, a bit of a an area of obsession that keeps on giving um, so I've always been a, a bit of a titanic obsessive anyway so uh, knowing quite a bit about it as I do I think um, this thing about the uh, the Titan submersible has been very interesting, and um, the the more the longer it goes on, the more we discover that the uh, this thing wasn't even really.
probably wouldn't be considered a proven seaworthy craft, um, which is just going to be it's just such a tragedy for the people who put their trust in it. Um, and of course, we all we all have to make those calls and decisions sometime in our lives, but I feel very sorry for these people who decided to put their trust in it in this particular thing. But, um, you know, at that depth, at the depth at which Titanic is, or even close to it, it's a, a pretty horrific idea to be stuck down there. And I, I think the probably the truth of it is, is that the Mercifully, it's far more likely out of all of the um, possible eventualities, the most likely one is a catastrophic failure of the hull, um, in which case their suffering would have been almost inst well, n nil, practically. Um, they would have had a pretty instantaneous death or, or unconsciousness. So there is, a, if that's the only small mercy about it it's it's a small mercy but um but thankfully so look i've got my nice shiny bridge ready to work and i'm going to flip it over for a minute and i'm holding it like that you see and i get my thingies and I pull the claw out as far as it can go get my pliers I'll put one on first, and I'll put the middle one on first. Uh, there's probably a tool that does this better than grabbing it by hand, but there it is. Once you've got it on there, it holds itself. So I'm going to use three, and I'm going to put them all in a straight line. So I'll get them on now, and then we'll see where we go after that. Yeah, so it's um, it's pretty pretty horrible to imagine um you know the, the worst scenario would absolutely be if they if it uh, got stuck on the bottom somewhere without there being a catastrophic breach of the hull uh if they just found themselves on the bottom waiting for the oxygen to run out i mean that's pretty that's pretty a grim version of it so let's hope that isn't what happened to them Okay, so uh, the the point at this point in time, my main concern still is whether, with the nut temporarily refitted, just in place, I want to see the relationship between these frets now and this saddle at the end here, where the where I've got it currently set. So if I can put on strings to do that, but in advance of strings, I can get a long rule like this and bit rested in the uh, what do you call it rested in the hmm, nut slot and now what I can see is there's barely any light under there so now I know that I can bring the bridge up a little bit on its posts and I can at least get lower than my target action which means I can get to my target action which is exactly what I wanted so that's the shim has solved that so we're we go so while we've got it here and we're in sort of a mix of cleaning mode I'm going to do up there screws on the back hand tight again um, or add an extra little grab um, and I think now would be a good idea to good time to um, lift out the pickups and give them a, a clean down a brush down or whatever they need um, so I'll bring you closer hoping you don't run out of um, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for batteries so pickups can first of all come out by removing the four screws around the pickup ring um, and that will just allow us to lift them out they won't come out very far because there won't be a lot of spare wire in there to do so but they should be able to come out far enough to just have a, a little kind of reach in now you can see there they've got a lot of grime on them so we can find ourselves a brush and see if we can get it a little bit cleaner yeah it's not too bad maybe we can give it a, a dusting and then maybe a little bit of a vacuuming this 
stuff, the tape doesn't clean up jet black and it, it does sort of hold the uh, dust a bit more than we'd want, but we can sort of safely give it a, a going over all round with very little space to do it, but we can juggle it around. So I think I think that's pretty cool in far, as far as the... Um, mm, mm, what am I thinking? It's cool as far as the dust on the thing is concerned. Now, I'm going to do a little thing around the pickup ring edge. Um, while I'm at it, I'm going to get a little bit of uh, car body cleaner stuff paste and I'm just going to put it on there so we can just clean away wipe away the um, kind of grime surrounding the pickup ring and it just lets us get in and close to the pickup ring and give it give each one or the paint around each one a clean so it looks like it's sitting when we put it back in it looks like it's sitting in on a nice freshly cleaned bit of paint so I can move that over to there, run up and down there. So I think you can probably see that's starting to look a lot cleaner. And then as we polish around the air a bit, we can drop that in there. So a lot cleaner. We can get some a bit more um, naphtha onto the surrounds, but I think they won't they won't get that much cleaner because it is an old guitar. But let's put the, the four screws back in here. Now when we're at this point um, I don't have, do I have any, I've got black pick guard screws here, in case we're missing any. Are these pick guard screws, well they're little tiny ones, so I won't replace them because I haven't got any of the exact same size. So we'll just put this one back in, in place. There we are. Now what I haven't done yet is test the actual pickups themselves, but as I explained to Oliver, there's not, there's no reason if it hasn't been pulled apart before there's no reason why the pickups um, pickup wires should be broken for any reason it always the things that move pots knobs and jack sockets they always break jack sockets first because they're subject to kind of a lot of levering action now what I could do with this one is I could have kill two birds with one stone uh, well, I could if I could find where I think I put the, here it is, that stuff. Now, this water sole will probably do a little bit of neat cleaning up both on the plastic here and the metal, but probably more the plastic than anything else. So this will sort of get rid of a fair bit of the grime, but it's actually doing the metal a little bit at the same time, which is quite good. And you can see it's, it takes away a brings up some oxidization on the cloth but it's not a bad way just to get this a bit fresher looking but we'll leave whatever rust is still on there we'll leave it on there okay so again give that a bit of a, a polish up and you can see it's looking a lot newer than it was this one in the middle has a staggered pickup pole so they have different heights in it so we'll We'll do the same thing, but it'll be a little harder to clean them. Let's do let's do these other ones while they're in place, so we've got a good kind of reach to them. Um, quite a little bit difficult to get reached um, in in these ones because they're sticking up so much. We'll try and get in there. not doing so much polishing of the poles on here. Each of these um, metal poles, by the way, can move if you need it to. You can, theoretically, you can lower them or push them in a little bit if they're sticking up too tall. And some people do that. They, they're very, you know, very clear about the way they want their pickup to, the poles and the pickups to sit, and they can hear the tiny differences that moving them about makes. I'm not sure I can, so, I wouldn't be doing that, but I get a tiny bit of paste down in between, but not the end of the world. Now, can I get some of this onto the ring? Yeah. 
a little bit. Uh, the problem with that then is that unless I take the ring off, again, wrong one, um, we can't really get to the ring without not only taking the ring off, but we have to take the pickup out of its ring in order to clean the ring up. But we're in, a, in for a penny, in for a pound, and we'll have a, a go at it. Now, all the while this is going on, part of me is thinking, how am I going to um, secure this neck with this fingerboard? So this is, this is what you do to remove the pickups. You undo that spring and that screw. And then same here. And then once you've got that out, you've got access to the pickup ring, which you can then put on the surface and clean around with your same auto salt. Now, I don't really have anything to put it on at the moment, but it does need some sort of surface to, just to hold it on. That'll probably help. There we go. And again, this this gets around the what would block it otherwise, which is the screw. The screws, when they're in the way, they stop you getting in and around them, and so you always end up with a sort of grime going around the screws so it doesn't look very clean. So there we've got our thing. This is the same size all the way around so we can just reinstall it. So what we do is first one through, spring on the end, <coughs> hold it up to the thing and fire away. And then the same on this side back on but the nut through bolt no nut bolt screw it's not screw is it yeah it's a pickup pickup ring screw um there we go. it's not the longest detour in the world so we run that until it's about two mil three mil sticking up on either side too much but that's okay and then we put that back on there so a lot fresher looking than before we can fine-tune the um, pickup later right next one after this will be the middle and then the This one goes directly into the wood of the guitar. And you can see it doesn't have a separate. Um, okay, that's going to fight me, is it? It doesn't have a separate um, surround to, to suspend it from. So this is okay. This is kind of held in place at the moment. So I'm basically all I'm getting a chance to do here is pull the cover off which probably actually is enough for what I want to do so I'm going to just sort of get around here and see if we can just vacuum off the dust a minute oh. I need to keep a check on the batteries it's probably going to conk soon Right, so we've got the these these types of screws are pointed because they go straight into the wood, as opposed to the other ones that um, just hang the pickup. So we can clean up this cover here quite nicely, again with a bit of aer aerosol, whatever that's called, um, autosol, and just a little bit of a polish off and clean up.
Yeah, the thing about the, the Titanic, it's, it's, it's starting to look horribly like a shadowing of the original disaster. You know, the fact that it's now turning out that the, the cause of the disaster is really corners being cut on any safety provision. Um, which is pretty terrible. And that, of course, that's what was behind the original disaster um, when there was l there were insufficient lifeboats um, for the passengers or crew in fact there was they ended up uh, 1500 people drowning going into the sea at least 1500 and only 800 got away in the uh, lifeboats and even then, more could have got away had they been filled properly, but they weren't. Now I'm running out of charge on this little darling, and it's also it's also quite tightly fitted. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off before my battery totally runs out. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, people in modern day thinking, I think people look at the Titanic and think of it in the sort of frame of mind that they scrimped on uh, safety, you know, and were were careless in that respect. But I think it was it was careless, and they they did scrimp on it. But the biggest, but kind of the reasoning behind it, I think, was this belief in its its un invincibility it's unsinkability um, I think they were you know they were arrogant about its capabilities and its strength and so on and its build quality and of course it turned out they were wrong about it as well as being arrogant and wrong so that, that was a bad combination but it was it was not quite the same as the you know modern day um, because it you know they, they didn't they didn't provide adequately for their first-class passengers, really. Certainly not for the men, um, you know. Uh, and, and they didn't, you know, they, they prepared or they catered even less for the safety of the second and third-class people. So, I mean, they prov they provided every other kind of luxury for those that first class and even quite a bit for the second class, I suppose. Um, so it's probably less about financial saving. It wasn't like the company was skint and trying to cut corners. Uh, I think it was a victim of its own um, hype and belief that it was unsinkable. So they were they seemed to be paying lip service to the, the Admiralty or whatever it was that demanded they fitted a certain minimum number of lifeboats. Um, now, you know, when you look at it from that angle, you think, what the hell was the Admiralty or whoever it was that set that target? You know, what on earth was somebody sitting there thinking, going, well, let's have a look. In the, in the event of a disaster, you know, what do we, how much, how many lifeboats do we need? Oh, I don't know, half, as many as there are people. I mean, whoever, whoever decided that was the best thing to write into regulations is got a lot to answer for probably more than the uh, shipbuilder of Titanic really um, because you know had they stipulated it had to have a larger number they would have had to have had it and therefore many more would have been saved so I actually bra blame the whoever it was I've forgotten now the Admiralty I'm calling it who maritime blah 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 who set the, the standards on these things because you know you can imagine explaining it to yourself in any shape or form well colonel so and so you do realize that this only allows in the event of a catastrophic disaster only allows us to take off less than 50 percent of the uh, souls on board you know and uh, it'd be interesting to find anybody in on that panel uh,
putting a case for why that was a good idea. I can't imagine they could put any such case. Anyway, the, this has got no slot, slant on it either, so it doesn't matter which side this goes. But yeah, so I think they're to blame, not the shipbuilder, called Mr. Andrews um, and Mr. What's-His-Face. Uh, Bruce Ismay, they did what they were allowed to get away with by the, the, um, the regulating bodies of the day. Although the truth is, Bruce Ismay is, is the most pitiful story in some ways. He was the managing director of the White Star Line, I think, and uh, he escaped on one of the boats while hundreds upon hundreds of men, women and children died in the ocean. He got away on a boat because he was he couldn't face going down with the ship. Now, it's a really st stirring, thought-provoking thing because I, um, you know, we all look at it and think, oh, I'm sure we would never have so little courage. But actually, you know what, faced in that awful, awful situation, would you, would you, could you stand there and go down with the ship? Would you have the courage and the nobility to do it? It's a horrible, horrible test that I would not like to have faced. But he did, and he didn't, con you know, conduct himself with dignity in that matter. And he got on a boat and left, and it. it he, um, he got put into a, a cabin on his own in the Carpathia, on board the Carpathia when he was picked up. And he shut himself away and went into a sort of mental breakdown because he couldn't live with his guilt um, and so on. Right, look, let's now... I'm um, going to need to do the tuners in a bit, but I still need to take care of the... Well, we've got the, the thingy right. We've got the geometry right, that's good. Let's put on the, let's put the new one on and see if, no, we're probably a bit too low. We might have to boost the new one fractionally. Let's put the old one on for a second. That's slightly narrow as well, but it sort of works. Okay, I'll put the strings through first. That's what I have to do. Um, these are 10, so they're not quite the same as what we'll be using, but we can do the fret leveling with slightly larger ones, um, and it will work perfectly well. <laughs> yeah, so very, very, very uh, horrible choice. Of course, he, um, oops, sorry, he had a terrible, lived a terrible, tor tormented life afterwards. Um, he never lived down having got off the ship while others went down with it. Of course, the inquiry that followed didn't, didn't let him forget it, that he'd taken this, by those standards in those days, this cowardly path. And it's shown in the movie. You see him getting off and sitting in his fur coat, or his big, yeah, big fur coat, sitting, looking sheepish and guilty in the lifeboat. And the guy, I think the, um, is it uh, Light Holler, the guy who plays Light Holler, is um, kind of looks him in the eyes with disgust as he waves the, um, at the waves at the crew to lower the lifeboat on the davits. So, and he knew, and Bruce Ismay knew. Horrible, horrible situation to be in. But he survived as a result of that selfishness and I guess it was an abuse of power because the, uh, the able seamen aboard the Titanic would be far less likely to challenge him than they would an ordinary male uh, passenger who'd got aboard the uh, lifeboat trying to get a get away. Right so what I'm doing here with all this curly mess of cheap guitar strings is I'm just going to um, hook these up for a minute 
have a look at that end of things. Now I'm going to use this, I'm running out of battery, so I'm going to have to stop in a minute and recharge a few things. But first of all, let me just get this D string on here and I pull up the end and I pull back one fret's worth and uh, no, it's going to give up. It will give up. I'll probably have to use my other drill. Come on. So these strings are going to be thrown away again shortly. Um, so I will put this on charge. I will grab my DeWalt and use that as a temporary screwdriver. That's on charge. That's on charge. DeWalt. DeWalt. Uh, put it on there, put it on one. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to do the, the G G G G G G G G G G G G <sighs> So you can see this is this is obviously a lot more cleaning and fixing detail than most setups that I do. Whoops, wrong way. Um, so we're going a bit overboard here, but it's, uh, as I said to Oliver yesterday, I can't, it's, it's against my religion to just do the one thing that's broken, which is the jack socket, um, and just replace that and give this back with the, with the saddle sticking up a mile and the things, all things filthy. And so I said, let me, <laughs> please let me do the whole thing on it. And you'll, if you don't, if you don't get why it's a good thing to do, and I'm sure you will. So. Hmm. so the way I put the strings on here is the same all the time, and it's a good locking system with very little or as little as possible string going onto the post. So I pull the string all the way through, pull it taut, grab it at the first fret and pull it back to the second fret. And that's the amount I'm going to wind on. And I wind it on and I hold this held string above the loose string as it goes round the first time. And then as it comes round the second time, still holding the taut string, I push the held string under the loose string for the second time round. And that locks the loose string between those two winds. And that gives it a really good grip without needing too much material or too much string on the post and that helps to minimize the amount of slack that it can store up but we'll stretch that out when we come to the end of the setup which won't be for a while yet so up all the way through first pull back one fret wind on keep hold of the held bit as it comes round go under as it comes round let it go over and there we have it I didn't pull it up that time because I could direct it without needing to do it. But now this is looking kind of good in the action department. I think that shim has made exactly the amount of difference it needed. We can get the right action we're after um, and get ready to level the frets out. Jolly good. So there's new strings. So these are inexpensive Chinese strings which I'm using as sacrificial strings so I don't mind just using them for this setup and then throwing them away before we finish the setup and then put um, decent quality Daddario's. What that's doing there, hope these not broken tuners. Okay, so I'm going to get a tuning fork at this point. I'm going to just try and get these to pitch. So I'm just going to screw this in a bit further because I don't want this lifting up under under load at the moment. 
I want it sitting down flat while I do the setup part of things. So to get that to behave, I tighten in the claw screws quite a way in on the tremolo, and hopefully that will keep it sat where it should. Great, so at this point in time, we've got a basic geometry that works. We've got nice low playing action. I think we've got a tiny bit more adjustment room available in it because all the adjustment has to come from these posts here. Um, but actually, I think we're, we're almost on the mark. This one wants to come down a tiny fraction, but not a hell of a lot. And therefore, this one will too a tiny bit. I think we're pretty much on the mark. We're at 1.5 and slightly under, so I'll just come up a tiny fraction with this one. There we go. That will be our target action. Now what I'm going to do next, before we switch off, uh, and I think what I'll try and do before the battery runs out, is let me get the prep leveling underway, and I'll probably do the majority of it off camera, but this is just to show you what I'm doing. So I slack the strings off at this point and I'm going to mask, uh, not mask anything, I'm going to ma use ma blah, 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 marker pen, huh, sharpie or something, nobo marker pen, I'm going to mark up all the frets for the fret leveling process. So you can probably see there, marking the tops of the frets. Um, now with this wear grooves on these frets down here, I may or may not smooth them all out. And the reason I say that is because I'm going to make sure the frets on this are level first and foremost, and I'm not going to carry on leveling just to smooth out those bumps. Now, in getting the frets level, I will probably get rid of most of those bumps, but I don't think it's a good exchange to get rid of those grooves just for the aesthetic mm, uh, you know, look of it. You're trading fret metal, which is obviously the life of the frets. You're trading it for just aesthetic considerations, because those soft grooves don't interfere with playing ability. So I don't think it's my personal take is unless a customer specifically asks me to get rid of those marks, I will let the normal leveling take away as much as uh, is, is necessary, or uh, sorry, as much as it can. Um, but whatever's left, I will leave on there. I'm going to do a, a quick pull stretch here, make sure it's settled or bedded in properly. As I pull, the um, tremolo plate is still lifting up. That's because I'm putting a lot more pull on it. When it's normal, it's just sitting there. So it's under the string loading, it's not pulling up, which is how I want it. Before we run out of batteries on this, I'm going to do the leveling and great method this, but I'll just do the first couple of tracks of leveling and then I'll go off camera, probably because I do need to recharge or else the batteries will just conk out. So before I do that, I just want to double check, mucky hands, double check what I've got in the way of um, relief on the neck. So I've got slightly too much on the first fret and a tiny bit of relief. That's okay, I'll work with that. This needs gluing, but it's not particularly important right this second. So I will come to that a bit later on. Right, so here's my clever leveling technique. 
I'm going to adjust my leveling beam to follow the curve of this neck and it's a very very precise and sensitive method. The adjustments are teeny weeny adjustments but it works really well. Still a teeny weeny bit more, probably getting covered in goo at this point. Right, I would say that's about right. So now what I do is I move this string to the side and I spread it out down at the bottom with my little rubber spacer and lo and behold I start the leveling process with this tool and um, all the time when I'm using this for the first pass on a guitar like this I'm looking to see what the where the tool's cutting it's got 400 grit sandpaper on it wet and dry paper so it's very delicate or very gentle cut and after a few passes with it I can stop and I can tell you that we've got low frets here these two so, so we call it normal low normal 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 low normal low so there's a couple of ups and downs there but I think we'll be okay I'll just do it a little bit more and what you then see on the second sort of go at the same area is you then start to see which are high if any are particularly high now it's only ever relative anyway so what we're doing is we're leveling frets with the neck under load now Oliver you're a, you look like a thinking man and you're going to say why is he leveling these frets with the neck loaded with the strings on and it's because when the le neck is noded the le neck is loaded and the strings are on the neck not only has curvature in it as you know from when you're playing it but it also has compression that'll do also has compression which squeezes it that way from end to end and that causes this bunching that I've just commented on that my leveling tool has alerted me to these slight hills these ups and downs in bunches so this tool is a great way because we're leveling with that uh, the string strings loaded or the neck loaded and, and relieved but also under under longitudinal compression um, we're leveling it in the configuration it will be when you come to play it. So you won't get any strange surprises creeping in because it will go back to being relatively level as we're getting it to now. Definitely low here, definitely low here, um, and a few odds and sods up this end, but nothing crucial. But there's definitely a pattern of clear highs and lows, or hills and valleys as I like to call them. So at this point, while I'm leveling, I'm looking to make sure all the notes play, first of all. And now what I'm going to do is, because now I'm lining up to level what I call the G track, the G track, this part here, in the sort of nearer the middle of the neck, that's where if the high E bends are going to choke as you bend them, that's where they're going to choke in the, in the G track. And that's also then the area that we have to do the most careful leveling if we have any... Uh, choke outs of the high E bends in the G tracks. So before I do it, let's see if we've got any high E chokes. Don't think we do, so that's good for a start. Um, but if we did, uh, this this is the track that we would be counting on to eradicate them. But since we don't. It says that the frets are pretty good to begin with, even despite these hills and valleys. I'm seeing that this end, we've still got some of the grooves. Um, I'm not going to overwork them, as I said. So now I'm just concentrating on making sure that all of these G track notes play. Definitely low spot there, but nothing too serious that it's currently interfering with play. That's the main thing. And we've got a very flat neck. Um, I checked the relief and it's very flat so this is going to feel like all Ibanez's can feel actually which is a very low light guitar but 
This absolutely doesn't come out of the factory like this because I've had a few of these through. Low spot. A low spot makes the next fret apparently high or relatively high. So I can see straight away that that's where this one's just buzzing, or not buzzing, it's, it's fizzing a little bit because I'm fretting it in a ditch. Um, and so the only way I can prevent it from having that little buzz is to just bring the surrounding frets down a little bit to the level of that low spot. Um, and that's what I just did there. And what we'll find is when we go back there, we shan't get that little squelchy sound out of it. Fine. Okay, now we get onto the bass side of the guitar, the wound strings, and this is the place where uh, often you get what I call fret slap, which is Instead of getting individual, you rarely get individual high or low frets, like we found one there, high fret, sorry, a low fret, causing the next one to appear high. That tends to happen in one spot. What I call fret slap tends to happen in uh, across big chunks of the neck, and it's caused by the presence of those hills, and those hills stick up, if you like, into the path of the string, and the strings that are wound and thicker move most. So the thicker and wounder you go, uh, the more likely these hills that we've talked about on the neck, on the fingerboard, more likely that they take away the little bit of clearance needed for the strings to freely move. So this method I use is brilliant. I won't go into exactly why, it's a long-winded thing, but it's a great method for eradicating that. That's pretty good. Happy with that. So overall, this neck is behaving well. It's not perfect. It's got the usual hills and valleys in it. it it's pretty good in that it hasn't got any immediate uh, high E chokeouts, and that's probably because it's a flattish radius anyway. Um, so the flatter the radius, the more forgiving it is in terms of bends, high E bends. Um, and it's uh, it's got a few little low spots um, uh, that, that were just getting in the way up the end here and it's got a little bit of slap um, to, to clear up but it's it's pretty good and that's why as a as a builder or a maker of projects and stuff if, if ever I'm looking for a donor neck to upcycle or reconfigure to use in a project um, let's see there's a high one down here right at the end um, I'm always happy to find an Ibanez neck, even from a Geo like this. Right at the end there, a tiny bit of... So I'll just go back to it with a little bit of focus on the end. And there's a, there is a high fret right at the end that's whoops, showing up. I don't know if you can see it here. It's that one there. It's actually quite high. So I'm going to now go back to that area and I'm going to concentrate just on that area there because I'm getting a little bit of fret slap which is telling me this high little hill down the, right at the end here needs taming. So I'm kind of taming it with a fair bit of pressure but I know from experience what it needs to knock that on the head. Now at this rate I may end up just... Um, doing the setup part nice and then doing the uh, somewhere leaving it overnight to uh, glue up the fingerboard because to get the fingerboard to stick back ideally I'm going to need to um, pull it apart a little bit squirt as much glue as I can get into there and then kind of hold it together some way the thing is the strings pulling this way holds it together anyway so it's for any for a it's the best sort of crack you can get because it's not trying to pull itself apart. Um, but we do want to get it stuck together so that we can smooth it out and get rid of this, this lip. So sometimes it happens because the wood in some part of it shrinks. Sometimes it happens because it takes a hit. Um, 
I'm feeling there's a distinct difference in the level of the wood here um, on one side and not so much on the other. So it does feel like something's shrunk um, and come apart because of shrinkage, which is not uncommon. And all manufacturers, not just the cheapest Chinese, but all manufacturers are in a struggle to cut costs and sometimes they end up using wood that isn't fully dried or they can't afford to leave it dry as much or as age as much as you'd like. I would say a tiny bit of up the top there. Um, it's just a frizzle, I kind of call it things like that because that's all it sounds like to me. It's, it's playing pretty well but it's just that little at the end of the note and it's not in one spot only, it follows five, or three, four, five, six notes at a time. So I kind of go back in and give that whole area a bit of a going over and it tends to tame it pretty well. Of course this will now end up feeling and looking nothing like the guitar that came in yesterday. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, I think it's time to re... So uh, maybe I'll do one thing. And uh, before we run out, let's take these sacrificial strings off and then I'll just do a bit of crowning. And if we, if we run out while I'm crowning, that's fine. still pulled out I'm just going to be as quick as possible so now I, I mark these up again and I'm going to use my Stumac recrowning file to um, uh, recrown these frets that I've flattened a little bit during the leveling which is that's how you get them level and then rather than leave them flat which would be uncomfortable and would slightly mess up the intonation what we do is we reshape them using a file like this and it's, it's got a concave side down there. I use the medium sized one and we basically go over the fret and we round off the sharp edges of the flat surface and we keep doing the file until we see there's no, there's just the thinnest little line of black pen down the middle and then we stop and that tells us that we've, we've not touched the top of the fret so we've re shaped it into an arch shape not not no longer flat but we've done it without uh, lowering the top of the fret so we've retained the relative levels that we had um, while we were doing the leveling which is important so you can see it doesn't take that long with this tool it costs quite a lot it's about 130 quid or something but when you do as many setups as i do it's paid for itself a million well quite a few times over not a million but it's it's peanuts over the years and it's just nice to have but I only bought it because I knew I would be doing this many setups whereas you can use a regular three-sided triangular file with one safe edge on it to do this job and it does it very well in fact it does it you, you can do it even slightly more accurately than this file but this is about convenience ease and speed really um, that's why I use it. Now the frets aren't massively high, so I'm using the medium jumbo side of this, and they're kind of just struggling, well not struggling, but the edges of the file are hitting on the rosewood, or the, sorry, the, not rosewood, just Jehovah or whatever it is. 
um, power ferro, no, just hover fingerboard, I don't know. Anyway, so it's a quite a good sign that you know when the frets are overall fairly low is that the recrowning file sort of rides along the wood um, fairly quickly. So when the ones I don't have to do hardly any leveling on are the ones that have the least um, sorry, the ones I do the least time with the recrowning are the ones that had the least leveling done to them. Um, and by the time I've gone over all these frets, I can see that I've hardly taken any material off anyway. This one's a bit harder hit. There was a high one right at the end here. I'm going to work on a bit harder to level that out. Not level it out, round it off, I should say. And the one at the end here needs a bit as well. And now we're done. So that's the, uh, the recrowning done. What I'll do next is I will um, probably take this neck apart, clean it, take the tuners off, um, and then off camera I will polish all the frets out and then come back when I'm ready to um, put the strings on um, and then uh, I will also, we're still running, we're still running. What we can also do, and maybe we can even do it now, in fact I'll do this now before I go off camera, I'll see if I can do it, um, and that is we will take off the take off the panel on the back and we will just check out the jack socket and make sure we replace it and make sure it works and then we'll do all the off-camera polishing of the neck. That takes about half an hour. Okay, our socket goes through solid, solid material there, so it's okay. It's not an easy access once we have to come out here. A bit rusty, this one. That looks a bit long. Thank you. The other one is as long. Okay, so we've got a pretty corroded old thing here. We'll get rid of this and put a new one on. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get on to recharging, but that's what I'll do, and then I'll I'll see you again in a little bit. Good evening. We're gonna finish this off just now, since we might as well. Um, it's a day earlier than I expected, but I've got the nut fitted and everything's ready. So let us put the strings on. So we're going to go for a down only tremolo on this. You can see everything's polished out. Fret's crown, sorry about camera work. Fret's crown, polished out. The neck repair is very good on that side. Uh, only a little bit of sanding needing, but it didn't join up quite so brilliantly on that side. It's, it's tight and it's glued, but there's a slightly bigger gap, which may have been some crud in there that I couldn't clamp out of the way, so, <clears throat> but it's solid, so that's not really a, a problem. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to zoom out, and I'm a bit hot and sweaty, so please forgive me. Um, so let's get some strings loaded. Everything's back on, juniors are back on, Whew. and then we can give Oliver um, a shout to come and get it, well, as and when, but oh, I've got to send an invoice. Doll. Uh, so let's stick on the strings. Now we went for nines on this because um, Oliver hasn't played this for years and, and probably better to start with a lighter gauge than a heavier one. So we'll feed these through the bridge at the back and up over the top. We'll get them all through and then I'll show you how I string them up for maximum security, minimum uh, string wound onto the posts because you you want enough to hold the string tight but you don't want so much that it stores loads of the slack Oop, hold tight slack right there let's move these screws out of the way before I lose them now I've forgotten where it was that I had my Wilkinson style arm but if I can't find it you can have this one which is the metal tipped one but 
It's a little bit more old fashioned looking maybe, but it would work on this because it just needs to be push in, which it is. It's come from some old, uh, some very old vintage guitar somewhere back in history. But anyway, so what I do is let's, let's do what I always do. Let's do the middle two strings first. So I'm going to zoom you in a bit on here if I can, if I can. Okay, something like that. Can you see? Yes. Right. So I tend to do the middle ones, the D and the G first, and it's usually that's because I'm usually I'm often because often I'm using a um, an adjustable nut in this place here, but I'm not on this guitar because it's got straight inline strings. If it was three aside, I could use an adjustable nut in there. But anyway, so what I do is I pull it when I tune up when I tune when I string, pull the string all the way through, make sure it's up inside the tremolo block then I grab it at the first fret and pull it back one fret and I get my winder oh wrong way and start winding now as I start winding I hold this bit the held part under tension so that it stays tight I hold it tight as it goes around and what I want on the first time is I want this loose bit to go underneath the held bit so I can guide it through like that and then as this comes around I can pull up the loose bit and this time, keeping the string t still, the held part still taut, I guide it underneath the loose string until it runs out. And, and I let it go there. Right. Then I do the, the, uh, the D, sorry, the G string. Again, it doesn't really matter so much on these because there are no adjustable nut going on here. Again, pull back one fret, start winding. As it starts to turn, hold it, pull it, lift it up over the loose one, this time under the loose one. You can pull it up, it makes it easier, but it can you can guide it under the loose one. And those two, approximately two turns um, are enough to grip the string perfectly well. And it's a bit tense, a bit tense, a bit too tight here, but I just wanted to get around to where I can cut the wire safely. So. Okay, then I'll do the B and the E. They're not together, literally. Come on, E. Oh, somehow the E didn't come up through there. Dang, hang on. That's not what we want. Let's do that again. Missed the saddle, thank you. Right, sorry about that. What can we say? Oh yes, we're still good. Right, B. So it's looking like they're seeing more debris at the bottom of the Atlantic where the Titanic wreck is and they're concluding that it's from the Titan submersible. Um, which I have to say, bizarrely, is by miles the best, best possible of the very likely outcomes because the outcomes were very always very likely that they were dead or going to die because there was no real practical way of getting to them. Um, but it's a mercy, a small mercy, that they will have been instantaneously incapacitated, rendered unconscious. There would have been no, nothing to feel or perceive or uh, think about. So it was a, as merciful a way to go as, as any possible way to go is. Um, not a nice thing to think about, but, you know, I think we would all, if we had a choice, any choice in the matter or ever even thought about it long enough, if we had the same, if we ever were given a choice, we'd want to go that quickly. Um, because, the, funny enough, I know this sounds macabre, and those of you who have had a similar experience will, will actually recognize what I'm about to say. But years ago, I had a major motorcycle accident. Um, a farmer pulled out, pulled his Land Rover out directly in front of me as I was passing on a main road in the countryside. And he just slammed straight into me. And I hit the side of his Land Rover slightly oblique angle um, but hit the back wheel arch of his Land Rover and that, I was doing about 
55 miles an hour because it wasn't a fast road anyway and uh, yeah and uh, so I kind of went into it with my hands attached leaving my hands in the front of the bike and it smashed the bike and smashed the Land Rover and blah 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 as you'd expect anyway um, so the point of this story is not our oh, poor soon the point of the story is to say that the thing I the, the thing I learned from it more than anything else and, and with the most profound ex consequence of it is I, I more or less lost my fear of dying now I don't mean that I want to die or that when I sit and think about it the idea of not existing anymore on the planet doesn't you know cannot sometimes get me slightly panicky but I lost my that, that sort of terrible fear we have of violent events and you know and I don't mean crime violent but you know like accidental violent events um, because what my experience was <laughs> perfect my experience was that There's no pain. There was no time. Um, and that was a that was an incredible thing. And so what it taught me or taught me was that when that if and when that time comes, um, you know, if you're in that kind of situation, I've gone, I've gone and done something now. I've set this at the at a perfect height, but it's fractionally higher now. I've done a perfect height and I've gone fractionally higher than I wanted to um, on this nut. <laughs> I didn't trust myself, so I put in some, I'll tell you what I did. I put some uh, foil underneath as a little lift because I thought, oh, it's probably, I can feel it's too low, I thought. But actually it was spot on, I didn't trust it. So I'm gonna take the foil off and just reattach it. Um, anyway, the, the yeah, the, so the experience was, I saw the, I can, can I remember it? I don't exactly remember seeing the vehicle as like a picture of it, the Land Rover, but I do remember the, um, the momentary kind of flash of, uh, actually it was a taste, a taste of adrenaline that kind of went straight in my mouth, that sort of, um, yeah, that, that acid burst, I mean, total chemical, I guess it's your body saying, right, you know, we're going to save you from any uh, upset or trauma. Flood the system. And that's what it did. And, and I had no, I, I remember that acid, that whoosh, it wasn't unpleasant or bad. It was just a, a huge jolt of medicine, I guess. And if you imagined it would be the, your, your kind of guardian anaesthetist going, Nasty impact in 0 0.000 seconds, um, flood system, uh, pain prevention, uh, pain prevention chemicals, go! And um, so, yeah, go they did. And uh, as a result, there was no feeling of pain at all. And of course, I, you know, I, yes, I was unconscious and I was chucked down the road. Um, but, like I say, no pain at all. So, that experience, I mean, I thought there was pain afterwards when I came to and, you know, ended up going in a hospital, you know, in and out of consciousness to a hospital, that sort of thing, and followed by people cutting my leathers and my back being in spasm and all kinds of weird stuff. But there was no, at the point of impact, there was nothing. But that chemical and the uh, anesthesia. Now that that has to be the body's incredible way of knowing that um, you know a big impact is imminent, and knowing that that's going to be traumatic, and knowing that it has to protect you from. Uh, the pain of it really I guess 
and it did it fantastically well. And so after that experience, I was kind of really perplexed, I suppose you could say, with that experience and how it didn't hurt. I mean, yes, I say there was memory of hurt, but that was after that was a long side in hospital and all that stuff. But had I died at that point, I could conclude that there would not have been any pain involved in my passing. And I guess what I'm saying is it's tr it's almost abs well, it's not almost it's absolutely true it will be true that the fate of those submariners will have been the same tape on that get off we don't want you yeah anyway i know it sounds a macabre thing but those of you who have been in a similar uh life changing <coughs> life changing experience probably um i'm sure many of you can recognize or identify with that experience um i'm just going to check the neck relief it's very very little on this guitar um, but it makes it so nice flat why not come on live dangerously <gasps> oh no I shouldn't have said that but yeah anyway that was my little sort of story to share um but it really it really I was struck by that no pun intended it was a very powerful uh, and very uh, um, mm, I think the word I'm looking for is reassuring experience um you know because I think as a lot of people are I've been I've been grown up and been terribly afraid of you know death and because we don't see it and we don't have any cultural much much or any cultural sort of dealings with it you know, most of our cultures don't anyway um so i like many people i was morbidly somewhere in the back of my mind terrified of dying um but after that i was consoled massively comforted and consoled by the experience that if if you die in a, a major traumatic uh, accident, like, um, for example, a plane crash, that was that been that was fact that was one of my other great fears was um, flying um, on planes. I think after uh, I had my bike crash, um, I think around that time after that, I lectured for about ten years, and I did a couple of sort of international trips while lecturing for for the colleges and stuff and then after that a few more years after that again i ended up working in a consultancy in london uh, for corporate companies and did quite a lot of overseas traveling as well with them so the there you go. look at that Okay, this is nearly perfect. Now I'm going to just carry on nattering for a minute while I stretch out the strings. Yeah, anyway, so the, I think the real payoff for that consoling life experience that almost certainly when you, if you were to die in a catastrophic accident, physically catastrophic, catastrophic accident, um, your body cuts off, your body can cut off your nervous system faster then you can transmit the impact of pain or the you know the experience of pain uh, that suddenly gave me a, a peace of mind that changed because before i had that experience in the past i never thought about it in a direct linear consequence but before i'd had that experience i would have been very um i was very nervous about flying i had quite a fatalistic fear of you know i could quite often just obsess about oh, falling uh, blowing up falling out of the sky um but 
after. Uh, and then when I got into doing a lot of traveling, I realized at that point that I had lost it. I lost it, man. Completely lost the fear of it, which I was kind of amazed by and, and just excited by because I could, I had actually found myself being able to go get on planes and really enjoy the experience of traveling places and you know, being lucky enough to fly somewhere. And so for the eight or so years I did that sort of round the worldy type work, I, I absolutely enjoyed just about every single um, business trip I went on to and made sure to just relax and enjoy it. Um, you know, with this sort of backup knowledge that if the plane fell apart in midair, even if I knew anything about it, the body's chemistry set, uh, the medicine cabinet, you know, your, your brain having the keys or my nervous system, yeah, my brain having the keys to the medical cabinet, as they say, um, would would take over and I wouldn't, it wouldn't ever be the terrifying, terrifying thing I thought it was. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some ways to go where you probably do have plenty of time to think about it, and that's not really what any of us want. But in this case, I thought, you know, if it's going to be an a Al-Qaeda bomb or something like that, well, it was going to go and we won't know anything. So I really was able to enjoy seven or eight years of flying about the way it should be enjoyed as a miraculous experience you know, that, that we're just so privileged to be able to do, like, as a human beings, get up there in the sky. Anyway, so, so that long-winded detour was really my consolation speech. I mean, my way of saying I have considerable faith or reassurance. I'm reassured or feel quite reassured that people who lost their lives in this doofa uh, tin can um, will have experienced no uh, no suffering and that that's for those who you know for all, all that when we think of our loved ones that's that's really what matters more than anything of course it's terrible that they're not here with us but you know we recognize that things happen and people sometimes go away from us and we lose people and the only thing after that that matters is whether or not they suffered and it actually you know it's the bit that we hurt most about if we thought our our loved ones suffered a lot before they passed on so i think i hope that their relatives can take some comfort from those who've been in near death situations I suppose you could call it and and those you know, maybe some of them themselves also know that and I hope they take some really comfort from that now just to finish this video off Oliver and, and for Lydia, this is information for you too. Um, the secret to your guitar playing in tune and staying in tune is the two things I'm going to tell you now. It's half, 50% your nut on the guitar and 50% the unreleased slack in your strings. If you take care of both of those, your guitar will play and stay in tune like it never did before and you'll absolutely love reaching for that guitar and playing it so we've, we've taken care of the nut part of the deal by changing it out for a tusk one because tusk has this built-in teflon stuff which um keeps the friction to an absolute minimum um, and so we know that the the um, we know that the nut is right that's 50% of our tuning stability equation the other 50% 
is this stretching of the strings and you need to stretch those strings until they don't detune anymore and that can take about three or four of these deliberate string stretchings now the thing to do is you've got to stick to this and have the discipline to do it because if you don't do this part of it even if you've got a good nut that's got teflon in it and it's cut right and you've got the right first fret action which we have now even if you get that right but you haven't stretched out your strings thoroughly the slack in the strings will keep on putting you out of tune for years to come and so you might as well have not changed the nut however if you do them both you will be rewarded with a guitar that's pretty much in tune when you pick it up off the peg Beautiful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we will conclude there. The Ibanez Geo, totally cleaned up, resurrected from the dirty, filthy dog that it was, um, set up with float, uh, not floating, sorry, down only tremolo, which is a, it will really stay in tune. You'll get the tremolo move, but it will stay nice and in tune. Um, pickups all working. The switch was crackly, so I had to spray some cleaner in there. I replaced the jack socket and tightened it up and made sure it was properly done. We put a shim in the neck to make it uh, to make the action correct. Um, added a spring, made sure the rest of the electrics are good. Take, took off the tuners, cleaned up the headstock, um, and glued back the split fingerboard. So it's not perfect looking, but it's nice and smooth because I've sanded it back and scraped it so the, the lip has disappeared so you can't feel the difference. So it's lovely to touch and a new tusk nut. And at the moment, very, very low, uh, very flat relief on the neck. So it's, a, it's incredibly low action, as you can probably see from there, and lightning fast and dead flat, which is what Ibanez necks are good for, except where the uh, fingerboard comes apart. Um, and that's probably caused by I think in this case, the fingerboard itself is shrinking. Um, so you, either side you had, well, the, the, sub, the consequence of it shrinking is that it breaks the glue. And what it then does is it overhangs. Even if you line it up perfectly, you've still got a lip because one piece is now smaller than the other. So you have to scrape it back um, to smooth it out. Otherwise it will bug you forever. But this feels lovely and smooth again. So that, that should be perfectly fine. I'm pleased with that. I can't wait to see uh, see your faces, see whether you like this treatment, because this is, you know, I wanted to be able to show you this. This is what you can expect from even a budget guitar if you do this work to it. And that's the that's the key thing. And, you know, as I've said many times before, um, you can't make it play like this with a inverted commas, 50 pound setup where somebody just changes your strings, polishes the guitar, uh, <laughs> You know, checks your truss rod and twe tweaks the action and then can't lower it because it's got you know tall frets or whatever this is the this is shows that when you do the work on it um every single guitar almost every single guitar can be turned into a beautiful player and i promise you this will be the best player you've had and i can say that with great confidence um and so i look forward to you confirming that in person when you get it back all right Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, that's not, I don't want to give the impression that's me being arrogant. It's what's born out of experience. There's a very big difference between uh, talking yourself up and knowing exactly what you you can do and have done time and time again. And that's all I'm really coming from. You know, I know this works and I know how to do it. And so I'm confident in what I can take on and, and the transformation I can do every single time. That's enough. See you soon. Thanks for watching.